Welcome to the third in a series of four Day in the Life of Hospital Executives. Uh, this morning we have the pleasure of Margaret Irving. She is the chairperson of the hospital uh, Butler Health Systems Hospital Board of Directors. And I'm glad to have you here, Margaret. Thank you, glad to be here. Um, we're going to um, ask a series of questions and uh, the students, you will be having the opportunity to view this video and at the end of the video if you have any questions you can pose them to me and I will pose them to Margaret to answer. So uh, first of all, can you describe how you became the chairperson of Butler Hosp Health Systems Board of Directors? Certainly. Several, four years ago, five years ago, I was president of Next Tier Bank, which is headquartered up in uh, Butler County. And I've been very involved in other community nonprofits, one of which I've served with the gentleman who was the um, president of Slippery Rock University. He was on the hospital board in charge of governance, so I got a phone call one day. So it boards typically, not just uh, hospital boards, but most boards really like to have bankers on their boards, so that certainly helps. But my involvement in the community was also uh, beneficial. Are you an employee of the hospital? No, I'm not an employee. I, it's a nonprofit hospital system. Uh, I am chair of the board, which is not a paid position. Okay. Um, now, when you started on the board, were you a member of the board first and then became the chairperson, or did you step right into the chairperson position? Yes, I was, I was a member of the board for just two years, and I got the phone call to ask if I would be interested in becoming part of the succession plan for the current chair. He actually ended up having a conflict of interest because he got a he was a consultant and received a conflict um, I'm sorry received a contract with a health care provider which put him in a position where he had to resign from our board so only just two years after I was on the board I became chair. Can you give us a little bit about your background uh, what um, education wise and uh, sure. how you became part of banking? Certainly I was um, I went to University of Maryland I was a finance major there and I grew up in a banking family, so I stayed in, after Maryland, I stayed in the D.C. area and worked for a few banks, and then I got the phone call to come home and work for our bank, our family-owned um, Next Tier Bank, and we sold it just a couple of years ago, but in the meantime, I came back and was working at the bank and, as I mentioned, very involved in our communities. Besides being on the board, are you on other hospital committees? <laughs> yes. As chair, I... I um, am a non-voting member for most of the committees, of which there are about six, so I try to attend every single one of them, or at least conference call in to each of them on a regular basis. You're busy with the hospital. Yes. Now, Butler is part of a health system. Can you describe what, um, how it became a health system as opposed to a hospital? Certainly. It's actually an independent health system, meaning that we're not part of a larger health system that would typically come to mind in the Pittsburgh area. The, the hospital is one of the components of the health system. Other, uh, other business lines under the health system umbrella, we have an ambulatory care service, we own physicians, they're in a separate corporation, and the foundation is also under that umbrella. What is the health system's mission statement? May I read it? Yes. <laughs> yes, the Butler Health System is privileged to be a healing presence in the communities we serve. We exist to make a positive difference in the lives of people by providing compassionate, high quality care and comfort and inspiring health and well being. You know, we had the day in the life of Tom White, who was the uh, chief executive officer at Jameson Health System. Right. And, you know, one of the things that he mentioned was the CEO as well as the board of the hospital and health system being um, kind of the um, uh, players for the community. They, that they have to always keep the community first in their mind and be a advocate for the community. Correct. And, you know, it sounds like the mission statement for Butler is the same, keeping a focus on the community. Absolutely. The, the, the community most certainly stays um, involved in the hospital and it's, a, it's a, one of the largest employers uh, of the region, so it's it's kind of a give and take that way. Perfect. Now, what is the goals of your uh, being the chairperson of the board and the board itself? What do uh, you feel is the goals that you have as chair or as the as the chair and as the board? 
So we, as the board, oversee the goals for the hospital and they report up to us in the whole entire health system. Uh, their accomplishments on a monthly basis. There's a fine line in between getting too involved in micromanaging as a board of any board, not just our board. Um, so we try to walk that fine line. We challenge some of the um, the, the uh, initiatives that the staff may take to reach those goals. We challenge if they're the correct goals. And that goes back to our strategic planning process, which I'm sure we'll touch on. But um, so our our main role as a board is oversight of um, what goals that we've and objectives that we've set for the hospital and their staff. What's your involvement with the CEO of the hospital health system? So our board meets every other month. Uh, he and I have planned meetings on a regular basis, but we also have ad hoc phone calls uh, throughout the, um, the, you know, in between different meetings. So he and I meet at least one time between our board meetings, but then we talk on a regular basis, and I'm involved in other meetings when necessary. And essentially, you and the board are his boss. You are the ones that uh, will determine his um, his reviews and evaluations, correct? Correct. There's a compensation committee that, that oversees that process. Uh, but um, as with any board, the CEO reports to the board which I imagine at times is sometimes frustrating, not only, again, for healthcare, but for other industries when you might not have industry experts on the board. And so trying to make sure that the board is, a, is as educated as possible about the um, strategic initiatives or the future of that industry is very key for a uh, key role of the CEOs. It sounds like you and the CEO work together to, uh, to produce an agenda for the meeting. Correct. How do you ensure a productive meeting, and how do you get that information out to your board? Do you get it out prior to the meeting um, in electronic or books? Or? Yes, good question. We, we've we switched up the agenda to some extent. So when I got on the board a couple of years prior to becoming chair, I felt like there was a lot of time going through committee reports, staff updates, not really hitting on the strategic initiatives of the hospital. So we switched it up to have a consent agenda so that there are a lot of um, items that would have otherwise been reviewed in the, in the meeting itself that we ask everyone to take extra time in advance um, in preparation for the meetings to read through. If there's any question of any of the items that are on the agenda, we can pull it out of the consent agenda and review it, but otherwise that has opened up a tremendous amount of time in the meeting so we can focus much more on strategic initiatives and quality or anything else that's going on that we need to be involved in. That's probably allowed for more uh, exchange by the members as far as what um, uh, discussions as opposed to um, dog and pony shows and things yeah, like I'm, that. Yeah, I'm very impressed. First of all, I want the staff um, to be able to present something so we become familiar with the staff and understand uh, the team that the CEO is working on. That's very critical for his success to have a strong team behind him, so I do want them to be involved to some mm -hmm. extent. But it's also very critical, and we're lucky that we have a very involved board, uh, I should say engaged board, because they do their homework. They do read in advance. They ask great questions, and some of the very small items that are in the packets, they, they pick up. So it's, um, it's think, good. I think since, like, a lot of trouble that Enron had with their board of directors, and I think, you know, boards used to be more of a um, rubber stamp and now I see that the boards are very engaged and they understand their roles as officers of the hospital. Ideally that's the case and it is the case with ours. We've been very diligent about um, getting the right players on the board. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually have a matrix developed that uh, the gentleman in charge of the governance committee really drove through and spent a tremendous amount of time on. So it, we make sure that we've got the skill sets, the expertise, the community and involved people. Um, so we have a, you know, the attorneys, the CPAs, the healthcare experts. I mean, we have a, a, a fantastic um, matrix of of capabilities on our board. How many members do you have on the board? It varies. Um, our our bylaws create a um, requirement to have so many physicians for every other independent hospital. I'm sorry, board member. Um, so right now we're between ten and thirteen. Okay, and 
Uh, how do you, whenever you do select a new board member, how do you orient them to the board? Uh, we actually have an orientation, but that's even before then. We have um, a pipeline of trustees that we want to start presenting. So we have term limits. Not many boards do, and I think it's a fantastic idea to have term limits on the board. Ours in particular is um, three, four-year terms. This year, in, at, at the end of 15, we have three board members rolling off have served their time. So we are in the process now of interviewing other trustees already. I might bring some on to be on different committees to get them more acclimated to the, to the hospital because it takes an awful lot of time mm -hmm. to, to create understanding of the financial aspects of a hospital, let alone the importance of the regulatory mm -hmm. environment, how hospitals are even paid or maybe more so not paid. And so to get that education uh, accomplished in advance of even becoming a trustee is one of our goals. So we've, um, so like I said, we have a, a pipeline of, based on that matrix, what skill sets we need to uh, complement the remainder of our board once these three cycle off. So it's a, it's behind the scenes an awful lot of work. Do you have an age um, limit too, or just a year limit? We do not. It's just an age limit. So they're on for a total of 12 years, they could correct. be on the board, correct? Um, have you, as far as your board, um, you know, I'm sure finance is a big part of your board meeting. Um, have you seen a change as far as the focus on finance as well as patient safety? Have you seen um, the percentage of time that's spent on quality and patient safety has increased over the last years? Um, since I've been on, they've been critical. Uh, the regulation that the hospitals or the healthcare industry have been under have been very similar to what I experienced in the banking world that we both got hit with a ton of regulation. So we've all been ramping up to understand how we respond to all of that regulation. Our committees have taken on a lot more work in re as it relates to um, those changes and those changes include different types of measurements, um, different kinds of payment process or systems, that, that we'll, how we'll get reimbursed. So the committee has taken on the um, most more significant aspects of those, but the reporting at the board has most definitely picked up. And the interest level of the board members in those items, the, the quality, the patient safety, yeah. the finance, um, yeah. and how we, how we measure or um, um, create a baseline for improvement. Right, your bench been metrics and the benchmarking, um, yes. So you have to have money to have a successful hospital and you have to have a high quality hospital to be successful, so they kind of go hand Those in hand. Those are conflicts sometimes, aren't they? They are, they are. <laughs> um, as far as um, talking about finance, are you part of the finance committee at the hospital? I, I am involved in the finance. I'm not a voting member, but I'm involved in all of those meetings. So, you know, um, the budget process, I'm sure, is happening about now, and uh, you're on a fiscal year of July through June? Yes. So, um, how does the board get involved in budgets, and how do they, you know, as far as um, the, the senior team will be coming to you with a budget that they want to spend so much money on capital and they're going to be spending so much on um, um, other things. Um, so what's the process by which the board approves a budget that's prepared by the senior team? The senior team will take it through the finance committee and they'll have several meetings. Uh, so you're right, this is the time of year that we're starting to look at the next fiscal year. So they'll have many meetings on the, on the off time between our board meetings to um, to review the budget in great detail, to go over uh, the line items of change as a result of the regulatory environment and some more uh, of those items kicking in in over time. Uh, the Finance Committee will um, present that via the RCFO, but in the board meeting. Uh, our board has as I mentioned, tr really transitioned a lot of the behind-the-scenes responsibilities to its committees because of the strength of those committees. We have fantastic financial expertise on that committee, and we we trust but verify at the board mm -hmm. from for the committee's work. So everybody has the opportunity to review the budget in advance, compare it to prior years, what's changed what we expect the both the negative and the positive impact on the budget year over year is, but we the, the, the heavy lifting is done at the committee level. I like the saying trust but verify and definitely building teams that you can trust 
um, you know, that was a saying whenever I was in the senior team at St. Clair, was, mm -hmm. you know, you have to trust, but you have to verify it too, because, Absolutely. you know, people make mistakes, and uh, so it's not something that you're rubber stamping. Exactly. Don't assume that someone else has reviewed it in great detail. Review it yourself, because you are a board member, and, mm -hmm. you, that, and that's your responsibility. Now, you had mentioned in the beginning about conflict of interest, and yes. I know on an annual basis, the board would be sent out a conflict of interest statement. Um, can you just explain what a conflict of interest is uh, for the students? Um, yes, it's if you have any contact, any role in your either professional world or other nonprofit um, boards that you're on that may be in con conflict with the hospital or the health system in total. Some of those might include um, any of their more significant vendors. You have to um, disclose if you're a, a percentage of ownership uh, greater than some amount, mm -hmm. uh, very small amount, or, yeah, yeah, it's a, certainly a, mm -hmm. definitely a minority percentage mm -hmm. of um, any of those vendors. If you in your professional life might also do business with those vendors, so perhaps those vendors could influence you. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> as an example, I was, um, I disclosed on my conflict of interest statement when I joined the hospital board that I was, I had a conflict being the president of the bank because the hospital banked with us. Mm -hmm. So I was not permitted to be on certain committees when I joined the board. And even when I became chair, interestingly, I could not be on the compensation committee because um, I would influence um, potential, I mean, according to the conflict of interest statement, I had the potential to influence the CEO's pay, who also banked with us. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't even permitted as chair of the board to be part of the compensation committee. Now since then I've switched jobs, and so I'm actually able to <laughs> have one more committee on my list. <laughs> you know, it's like um, if the hospital has someone from construction on the board and they're aware of any projects that are anticipated by the board that they might have an unfair advantage to knowing what you know, what you're looking to pay, Correct. what, you know, that they're able to do some under the table type of dealings that would not exactly. be fair. That's exactly right. Or get involved in a bid process before the rest of the, the potentials, um, potential construction companies even mm -hmm. had an opportunity to start on it. Right. That have incited insider information. Right. Nobody wants those words on your, on no. your list. <laughs> um, switching to strategic planning. Yes. You know, Butler had gone through a major strategic planning with building a new facility. Yes. And uh, can you explain some of that uh, strategic planning process and maybe a little bit about, that was a major project that the you underwent. Tower, the tower? I wasn't on the board when the tower was built. And I'm referring to a new addition to the hospital several years ago, um, I don't know, maybe even nine years ago by now, the hospital had um, planned on finding new property to build a whole new hospital on. Mm -hmm. And say in, of course, Butler County somewhere, but at the end of the day, it ended up making more sense to build a tower, a um, very um, new technology type tower and, and great patient care. I've heard it's been it's very good. It's really wonderful. Um, right on the same campus where we are now. So it was, um, it was a great idea. Now we are also at this point um, building a new facility to offer more services um, to a broader extent to the to the communities that we serve just right down the hill from our current um, mm -hmm. hospital site. So the process of going through that also goes through finance, goes through quality care, goes through um, many of the different um, committees to make sure that we're, you know, it's well vetted and we're doing the right thing for the community and the hospital, and then it goes to the board. And we've gotten outside consultants to get extra opinions. I mean, it's a tremendous amount of time and effort to go into getting that final stamp of approval. Now, do you um, uh, survey community members as far as what they're looking for the hospital? Um, do you get input from the community? Not so much do you like this or do you like that, but the surveys we look at are population health. So what are the needs of the community? Mm -hmm. You know, what are the highest levels of... Um, um, disease rates, I'll say. Um, are they, is it heart disease? Is it women's health care? So there's a very interesting report that measures the difference between what our community is um, experiencing as it relates to health needs and how many doctors and physicians are in the market to serve those needs. So that assists us with not only our physician hiring 
or at least contracting, um, but also um, are we serving those needs of the community? So it's not more, it's, it's more of a, um, it's more of a science of looking at the healthcare needs. Not a satisfaction. In the Correct. Now, um, how do you determine what direction the hospital goes in the future? Do you have a crystal ball that you and the CEO yes, look at? Yes, in fact, it's, I brought it with me. It's, it's a piece of cake to understand what's going on in the healthcare industry. I wish that were the case. Um, we'd all like to think that we have control of our own destiny. We all know that that is not true. So we have intentions. We have strong strategic plans. We know exactly where we want to be financially. Uh, what business unit lines of this, um, I'm sorry, what business lines we need to be in to make sure we are in fact serving the community. Um, we have a, you know, one year, three year, five year, um, and we're even looking at doing a longer term potential impact in, uh, to the health care. Every year something takes us a little bit off track, whether it's the regulatory environment, whether it's change in the payment um, reimbursement system, I mean something always puts a little nick in our plans, but that's the same with every industry. Mm -hmm. You're just ready for those side side trips. Change is the only thing certain. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. <laughs> now, um, with any hospital, qualified physicians are your your lifeline. And so how do you how do you attract qualified physicians and retain them? It's a great question. So physicians become obviously the the lifeline of the health of an of a of a hospital system. They're not always employees. In fact, very rarely. I mean, it's a very small percentage of your physicians that actually are employees. Um, so you have to contract with those in the market to make sure that they have access to the hospital because they also drive your brand. So it's a very um, intricate uh, relationship that you have with your physicians. You have to have a level of respect, back and forth, you know, mutual respect. Um, you have to. Um, make sure that they have the tools necessary to do their jobs. They usually are the ones that raise their hands and say, I have a physician that you need to talk to, whether it's to acquire their practice, which is happening like crazy now, um, or to just bring them into the hospital to um, be a contracted physician. So you're seeing an increase in the number of physicians that are looking to be employed by the hospital? Yes. And uh, we're also seeing a tremendous amount of activity by other, the other larger systems in the market of, of acquiring those physicians' practices. Yeah. So they're becoming far and few between to find, still find independent physicians. I think they, with the reimbursement changes, uh, physicians are looking for security. Correct. And security in the hospital. Now, Butler's been able to maintain its independence. Yes. Um, um, they are becoming one of few, as, as, as was St. Clair, yeah. as the one of few independent hospitals. And um, you know, I, I know, you know Jefferson just going with uh, Allegheny Health Network, you know, there's less number of independents. You see me, Butler being able to maintain its independence? We hope so. We, I mean, that's our plan, is we want to be an independent hospital to maintain, you know, community services so you can go um, to Butler Health System to have so many more of your heart services than having to go into Pittsburgh or your um, cancer care instead of having to take a long drive into town. So we find a tremendous advantage of staying independent for our communities. We have been successful in that so far mm -hmm. um, and that is definitely our intention. As many are, I mean some can't make it work. Right, and um, you know Butler doesn't have a lot of competition, they do have Cranberry but uh, you know, a lot like in Pittsburgh where there's someone right at their doorstep. Correct. Yeah, the, the closer you are to Pittsburgh, the more difficult it is. Yeah. Now, with Butler being a nonprofit hospital, it's some it's an obligation that the hospital gives back to the community. Um, any thoughts on how Butler does that for the community? Well, um, a lot of that is happens to us, uh, meaning that we give care to our community whether they have the insurance or not. So. Of all of those independent hospitals, we do a little bit of benchmarking amongst ourselves to see how we're doing on many different um, um, measurements. One of them is the, um, the non-pay um, patients that come in. We actually have the highest number of uh, patients coming into our hospital that do not have any access to um, insurance. So it's, it becomes a higher um, number not to crack, basically. Mm -hmm. And we have to 
find ways to compensate for that free care that we're giving. Um, you're saying compared to other hospitals in the Western Pennsylvania? The independent, the independent, independent hospitals in the market. Now, um, being a nonprofit, we were, just had some discussion in one of the classes talking about, um, you know, tax exempt and, you know, giving back to the community and um, having, making sure that you're giving back enough that, uh, you know, based on the community. Um, having un, or uninsured patients with the Affordable Care Act, do you anticipate there'll be a decrease in the number of uninsured because it's now becoming a uh, mandate? A requirement. Uh, well, I, I'm, this is my independent thought as opposed to being chair. I'm concerned that it'll almost have the opposite effect, that it'll actually increase the number of uninsured because at this point, um, corporations can pay not to right. provide insurance. The, the fine that they receive for not offering insurance to their employees is actually less sometimes than the insurance itself. Yeah. So it could actually create a higher need um, of insurance from, from the communities. Yeah, that's, you know, and also an individual, the, the penalty is less than what it would cost exactly. to have insurance too. So, um, now, we've talked a little bit about the selection process of the board. You know, what type of traits are you looking in a board member? I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> I'm going to try not to sneeze. Now that I said it out loud, I won't have to. Sorry. Um, the traits that we're looking for are, um, you know, it's a, it's a matrix that we've developed on the skill sets. So it's um, what what is your expertise? What is your line of business you come from? Again, we want to have attorneys on the board. We want to have CPAs on the board. Um, anyone with some kind of a, other finance um, background. We want those involved in the community. We, we really want disciples out in the community spreading the good word every once in a while or finding other board members for us to create that pipeline that we have. We, um, we want those that are in the C-suite of um, large employers um, in the community so that they understand and uh, can bring our message back mm -hmm. also to their employee base. Um, those people that are um, very involved in the in their communities. As much healthcare knowledge as possible, but that's the one that's difficult mm -hmm. to find somebody that isn't conflicted out with a, with the right. healthcare. There's a real fine line there. Um, and of course, we have physicians on our board as well that that represent all of the other physicians that use our facilities. Now, does the board member need to reside in Butler County? No. So they, they can be outside of the county too? In the, in the um, areas that we serve, um, which we have um, other facilities that are much, well, we, we are actually um, in, in many contiguous counties to Butler County. To try to spread the market area. Correct. Now, um, education for the board. Do you, what type of education do you pro provide to the board? I've been a huge proponent since um, I've become chair. So we've, we've set a half an hour aside in advance of every single board meeting to cover something, whether it's to get, do a deeper dive, as an example, into our budget so we don't take a half an hour out of the whole board meeting. And they're not mandatory, but just about all of the board members do show up. Um, there are other, um, we have a list of the type of training that we ask the board members, what do they need, what do they want, um, all of the, um, you know, the hot items that are going on in healthcare, we make sure we set aside time for in advance of the board meetings. Along with that, we send our um, board members on a, um, there are so much education that's offered by the associations that service the healthcare industry, so they go to retreats on an annual basis and, and hear a lot. And the last time I went, as an example, I came back with pages. I, I wonder sometimes, does the staff really want us to go to these? Because I, I talked to the CEO, our general counsel, our COO, our CFO. I mean, I was shooting questions out everywhere, <laughs> things that I heard at this conference. So it's a mixed blessing, I'm sure, for yeah. them. Education's <laughs> important because you only know what you know. And if you, right. if you don't go outside of that area, you won't know what's out there. Exactly. So. Now, the staff comes to the retreats with us, so they're hearing it at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we all huddle at lunch or whatever and talk through what we just heard. Yeah. So it's Being good. in academia, I know how important education is. Absolutely. Um, now, what would you say is the most rewarding part of being the chairperson? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, I have been fascinated by the healthcare industry and as I mentioned the similarities and the parallels with the with the financial industry. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned both industries got really bombarded with 
regulation for one reason or another. What I think is happening in the financial industry is it's going to create um, ongoing and maybe even enhanced um, merger and acquisition activity because the burden of carrying that regulatory expense mm -hmm. is going to drive a lot of smaller banks out of business. In the healthcare scenario, it's you have to recreate yourself, you have to understand what's coming down the pike as much as possible in advance and react to it, but also I think it's creating opportunities to do a better job of what do you need to do, what do you what do you have to do in your in your industry? What can you collaborate with without mm -hmm. and still stay independent? Um, which th so there are a lot of meetings that I have with the CEO about what is it that we can we can maybe outsource mm -hmm. and create another corporation with others in the same situation that we are. That's not going to make a difference. It doesn't mm -hmm. have any impact on confidentiality or HIPAA roles or anything else. But it takes that um, that overhead off of our um, backs basically and and puts it into a center where we all can share in the expense or frankly sometimes share in that income yeah so it's it's being um, quick on your feet in healthcare so I I've, I've been uh, fascinated by learning something at every single meeting at every single magazine I get you know on the healthcare and uh, and it's changing so rapidly it's hard to stay up with that's you know it's what is today could be different this afternoon. Oh, yeah, you know, what time so, is it? Yeah, it's like <laughs> what I know, happened. I know coming into work, it was like you know, I thought I knew what I was going to do the day, but sometimes it could be derailed oh. by something that the government sent out, something that something happened, um, something within our own backyard, right? Because there's a lot of activity in the healthcare world, oh, right, right in this region. What would be your the hardest obstacle that you've had to deal with being a chairperson or, or being a member of the board? Well. Um, We've had a pretty good run at it since I've been on the board, you know, as far as our financial performance, mm -hmm. um, our safety numbers, our quality numbers. Uh, we've had we formed some great partnerships, um, one with Highmark, one with UPMC, on providing that care locally with our physicians via those organizations. So it, the challenge is understanding that you have a bucket of um, a capital expenditure, you know, mm -hmm. funds. Um, and it's limited, and you don't. It's not an endless bucket. No, you don't have just you know some money tree or um, uh, you know unlimited unlimited check writing capability. So where do you spend those dollars in the most um, strategic way? I mean, is it is it acquiring those physicians' practices? Is it spending more on technology, which is very easy to overspend on technology? Um, is it getting prepared for some of the more um, comprehensive regulatory requirements like the electronic reporting. Mm -hmm. I mean there's so many things that you have to really um, be very uh, diligent with those dollars. So that's the challenge I think that not only our board but every board has in the healthcare industry right now is yeah. You have a you have a you have a bucket of funds, and how do you spend it most appropriately? For the Everybody future? wants you to spend it on their department, or a physician wants you to buy another Da Vinci, or they want to buy something else. So exactly, that, you know, they're they they. So your job is to make sure that everybody's treated fairly, and that you're looking at it uh, the big picture. And ideally, to. when you do spend something out of the bucket, because of course things come up through the year that you didn't necessarily budget for in every industry, again, not just our hospital. But, um, so when does that become a creative? I mean, what does mm -hmm. that look like? Is there an ROI on those funds? Uh, you know, is it, is it an expense that we just have to incur to meet the regulatory requirements? Mm -hmm. So there's a whole lot of questioning around that, that expenditure coming from the board, probably through finance that they've already vetted it. Yeah, it's just amount, like a home so. budget, that contingency exactly. that you get you know, if your car breaks down, you got to get it fixed. You probably didn't on plan it. on it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, we touched upon the quality metrics. Is there a scorecard that you look at um, to determine to get a pulse check of what you're doing within the organization, how the hospital is doing on certain things? Yes. Yeah, so the the committees themselves go into more detail. We have several scorecards, probably on just about every single committee. I say that. Um, but we, it, it's it's very, um, it's a telling snapshot. Um, for our board who might, well, they're not all involved in the other committees like mm -hmm. I am, but it tells them, 
green, you're doing what you said you were going to do and you're on budget, you're on time, you're on track, whatever the green light is. Yellow is if we keep this pace up, we just might not get there. And of course the red is where you focus. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there, there are finance metrics, there are quality metrics, safety metrics, um, meeting the requirements of all the regulations. I mean, so there's, there's a tremendous amount of measurements that, again, are managed mostly at the committee levels and vetted for hours in those meetings that then they get to the board and we still spend some time on them, but not as much. Um, you're dealing with a group of people. Do you ever have conflict amongst the, the members? And Absolutely. How do you resolve that? And, you know, conflict is not always a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, so we have some board members that are um, very risk adverse. We have others that say we have to forge ahead and get going on, on this item. And it becomes a very healthy balance. Because if you had everybody sitting in the room who actually agreed with each other, that's dangerous. I mean, you can't let... Um, you can't just be that rubber stamp. You have to challenge um, some of the decisions and understand that because if they come back, it's not just the CEO's back, it's it's the board. That's, so that's uh, we make sure that part of that matrix is, you know, how, how is this person wired? Um, is, the, is the person, again, more risk adverse that they'll actually ask the questions that uh, need to be asked about what are the downsides of making these decisions? We have to have those that almost become an uncomfortable position about pushing us towards doing more in healthcare, like some of the for-profit systems are doing. That's so that healthy balance um, does create conflict, does create awkward situations and conversations, but at the end of the day, we all should walk out of those board meetings and realize that you know the decision that was that we landed on was the right decision and well vetted. That's, that's true. Now, do you see yourself as an, an ambassador or an advocate um, for the community? Yeah. Um, and do you think the board members also see that as their role as being an advocate or an ambassador? Absolutely. We, we call ourselves, um, you know, kind of disciples or, or ambassadors so that uh, people know that we're on the board of the hospital. It's, um, you know, because of our brand, per se, and our image in the community, people um, want to be on our board. So they ask us about the hospital and its performance and, and what we have going on. We try to be very active in, with our PR and make sure that we are, in fact, um, kind of shouting from the rooftops, rooftops about some of our you know, latest and greatest either acquisitions for the physicians or acquisitions of equipment that we have or our capabilities or our quality measurements. I mean, there are a lot of things that we have to be very proud of. So. Mm -hmm. If the paper doesn't pick it up, then that becomes our responsibility. That's right. That's right. What better advocate than the people that are uh, serving the board? Now, as far as um, your role as a chairperson, how long is it? How long of a um, position is that for you? There are um, so if our, our normal board members' roles are uh, three four-year terms, so twelve years. As chair, I have two two-year terms as as a possibility. So you're in the second? I just got on the second, yes. So um, in two years, you'll be, is there, um, as far as the succession plan yes. for, is there a, a vice chair of the board? We have the ability to have a vice chair in our, in our bylaws. We have not had a, a vice chair. But what I'm um, actually in the process of doing now before our next board meeting is making phone calls and reaching out to each of our um, board members and asking them to participate on committees I've, again, building that matrix and understanding the balance that needs to occur on each of the committees with not only that risk adversity versus, you know, entrepreneurial type out, um, outlook, um, but also the skill sets. I've asked people to shake it up a little bit on the committees. That creates uh, not only um, more educated board members, but it does create a better succession plan mm -hmm. for um, that next chair or, or the next chair of any of the committees, in fact. You know, succession planning is probably one of the things that organizations don't put enough attention to, um, that even with the CEOs or the senior team, because, you know, you, you think you're going to be there forever. Agreed. And um, then it's time to move on and that knowledge that's so important to pass on. Correct. Absolutely. So that when I was... Um, approach to see if I wanted to be in the succession pipeline for the chair position, 
uh, they, um, they asked me to participate on a couple of committees that are um, really where the meat of the, of the matter is, and that is the um, um, quality and professional. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's where we go over the safety, where we go over the, all the, the scorecard of how the hospital is performing um, to its health care standards but also finance. You know, you have to understand how the hospital is getting paid or, again, maybe not getting paid mm -hmm. and understand how to compensate for those um, that are not insured. So I, I started um, on those committees and then, you know, the, conf the, the conflict issue mm -hmm. came up. So I definitely became chair before anybody anticipated but that's why you have a succession plan because right. you can't, you know, there's no crystal ball for that either. Right. You mentioned the bylaws, and bylaws is what the hospitals um, run their organization by. Yes, uh, there are there are um, bylaws that have been, um, you know, kind of behind the scenes, become part of the governance of how every organization works. Every every organization should have bylaws, but it dictates um, the comp the composition of the boards, it dictates uh, the succession plan for um, the CEO, if something should happen to the CEO, who becomes the next in line. Mm -hmm. um, it talks about um, how many meetings we need to have, what different committees, what the structure is, the percent, the number of people have to be on each committee. I mean, it's a, it, it definitely becomes the, the, the backbone of how our governance works. It's very black and white. Yes, and, uh, and you know, I'm sure bylaws are reviewed on an annual basis. Annual basis, and attorneys get involved to make sure that the wording's are correct. And uh, exactly. So, um, finally, um, you know, we've got these students that are healthcare administration students, and what advice would you give them as they continue their career? And they're hoping to get into a hospital uh, position somewhere. Um, you know and I've encouraged them they need to be patient, they're not going to be a CEO tomorrow. Correct. But um, what do they happen? want to be? I think the best thing, the best advice that I could give to any student who wants to um, become an administrator is don't be afraid to get your hands dirty, to start at the level, and as one of my friends always says, I will help you write your strategic plan or I'll go out and get you coffee because everything in between is going to be critical. The more you understand about what your staff has to do on a daily basis and respect them for it, the better you will be as, as you know you rise up to that C-suite. And I'm talking about not just your staff as it relates to other administrators, but more importantly maybe the, the physicians. The more they have a respect and regard for you and what you do um, to run the hospital, the better the hospital will work. Most hospitals have unions for the physicians, for the nurses, and if they feel like, if those unions feel like you as an administrator understand what they go through and what their um, daily lives look like, the more successful you will be. So um, some of the best physician, I'm sorry, some of the best staff members that I have seen are um, ones that maybe even went to medical school for some time to understand what physicians have to go through and a, a strong appreciation and respect for the physicians. And you know, I think too it's a teamwork that every person, it's almost like a puzzle coming together and everybody has their strengths enough to understand what each role, their role is. The interesting thing about hospitals and the revenue that's generated from hospitals is they're not from your employees. They could be contracted physicians mm -hmm. or, or just the, those physicians that have access to your facilities that are driving your revenue stream that could be gone tomorrow. So to, again, to have that healthy respect and appreciation um, that is um, a two-way street is very critical for success. Perfect. Any final comments? Well, uh, it is a very rewarding um, health, the healthcare industry is, is one that is changing on a regular basis and it's rewarding and exciting to be part of it. And um, I've in fact encouraged my own son to go into the healthcare industry as administration because it is so dynamic and there will be, I'm anticipating a great need for, you know, fresh ideas and understanding coming from students these days. So I wish everybody luck and I think um, it's a great field you're entering and um, hopefully I'll see you on the other side. 
And it's definitely one that is, is a vast amount of opportunities out there. Absolutely. Just having the patients Growing. To, to, to wait for that position. Correct. But, uh, well, students, if there's any questions that you have, please let me know. There'll be an assignment based on this interview, and um, I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Uh, we will have another day in the life of uh, coming up with the CFO of the hospital. So thank you very much, and I want to thank you very much, Margaret, thank for you. Uh, giving us the opportunity to hear what uh, what's going on with you and Butler and the cheerperson. Uh, thank you. I enjoyed it. Thanks.